Hello and welcome to another Open Source Workplace interview series. Today I'm here with Hannah Nardini. Hannah is a workplace strategist, an interior designer, and a change manager. A lot of work, mm -hmm. but a lot of uh, a, a lot of co topics covered there. But I'll let Hannah explain um, who Hannah is and and uh, her her experience. So Hannah, welcome. Thank you for joining us today at Open Source Workplace. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me and my background. So I'm 25 years um, in corporate interior design. So it's kind of my main training when I first started. Um, and I kind of what triggered me to move more into analytics and consultancy was designing spaces that um, we all thought looked beautiful and looked great. But the reality is I was noticing that just people weren't using them. Um, I was just quite fascinated to understand why people would default to certain spaces and not others. Um, so it led me down much more of a occupational psychology route um, to really just understand human interaction, human behavior. And then I've learned to apply that into the workplace. So how do we do really simple things that not only look good, but also meet the functional and preference needs of the individual? So it was kind of a really good marry of looking at workplace very differently to most traditional interior designers um, and as time's gone on we've learnt that it's quite a niche area really there's not that many people who really apply those principles in workplace consultancy so for us that part of our business is a significant um, proportion of what we do but then also looking at the change management piece is the behavior alignment of you know okay we've come up with this idea and this is how we really want people to use the space um, how do we actually get them to do that in practice? So it's, it's a whole other area, but absolute vital component to what we what we need them to be progressing forward with. So my company um, started almost six years ago now, um, and we very much just focus on offering those key services to corporate clients, um, but on a global scale. So we're not just based in the UK; we actually work internationally. So much stuff I want to get into there, Hannah. You, you covered a <laughs> wide gambit, you know. And, I and did. Also, you know, <laughs> managing a real estate uh, portfolio workplace strategy, there's so many things I want to delve into. I guess I want to take a step back, though, so we go through things mm -hmm. a little sequentially. So how did you get into interior design? Um, it was just an area that I just found I was I had an ability in, really. Um, I do believe there's a lot of elements of design that can't be taught I think you're either kind of a creative person and you grow up with that through your education um, and I did I was lucky to have a great teacher who opened doors for me um, I looked at work experience across every single design sector so I was lucky enough to explore product graphics um, retail and I eventually sort of stumbled into interior design and just took a liking to it I think be able to look at workplace which is a, somewhere that we spend so much of our lives um i think is just a, is a great area to get involved in but it's not a massively promoted one so um so no it was it was kind of stumbling into it by accident i think to some extent but never look back it's been a great journey so far yeah what's your favorite aspect of interior design um what is in the design process or you tell me in essence you know because it's it's i have to imagine right so I, mm. I i know whenever i'm delivering a space yeah the the process is is interesting it's fun but actually for me mm. it's whenever users walk in and you see them using the space activating yeah. the space that's where the real yeah. uh, results are seen so i'm just curious from a you know a provider mm. perspective what actually gives you that sort of pleasure and joy yeah um, I think knowing that you've created a space that people enjoy being in um, it encourages them to actually make friends, to communicate, collaborate. I love walking into a space and it's just got a buzz and an energy about it. Um, but for me, when it comes to the sort of measured success of the project, because we do a lot of work post occupancy review work, to actually identify how much happier are, are people, are they more productive? Are they finding that you know attrition's reducing? Are they attracting key talent? That for me is a sign of success. Um, I'd say more so than just seeing people using the spaces. It's knowing that it's physically worked for the organisation, but it's also beneficial to the individual. Yeah, no, that's it's it's great, and I mean that's that's the whole driver between actually building out Absolutely. a new space and creating a new space. So. What 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 do you think? Because you say there's uh, ways you address that, and you measure that. What is the sort of mm -hmm. one thing 
that you've seen benefits the most from interior design to retention and attracting mm. talent? Um, wow, that's a wide question. Um, so what benefits? Uh, so the measures that we particularly like to put in place is around um, workplace happiness, general satisfaction and productivity. Um, obviously incredibly hard to measure. Uh, very subjective because we do know that the world looks different on Monday morning than it does on Friday afternoon. So we have to kind of cut through the natural bias that people can put into these things. But we found a way of creating um, a measured or a matrix system in our consultancy that enables us to test it before and after. So we, we kind of noticed that productivity is one of those areas that if a project is embarked on properly, people are fully engaged. They're a part of that journey. They're a part of the end product. Um, and they come with us on that. We do tend to see that where we are able to put measures against it, it's around a 21% gain. In productivity which is immense because if you think about that organizationally if you could say to an organization just by investing in this we believe you could achieve x y and z it's a no-brainer not to be considering it but we do believe that a lot of the productivity gains are actually not through massive investment it's mostly driven by um, just understanding the differences and the preferences that people have got and more often than not personalities is the biggest thing that comes into play here um, so it's instead of doing a, a generic one size fits all, we just shove everybody into open plan. It just absolutely is not the right way of doing it. And it's, it's about learning the individual personality traits that people have and what they need out of the workplace to be efficient and productive. And when we start to look at that, we can put in quiet areas, focus spaces, silent libraries, call booths, areas that you can just move away from a group and do that and we see the biggest productivity gains are actually when companies embrace this approach to workplace and put those type of spaces in but it all leaks back there is no point designing a workplace with all of these other areas and encouraging mobility if the culture and the management within that workplace actually kind of puts people on the bungee and makes them kind of yeah we've kind of given you free reign to some extent but you're not really allowed to use it um, and that would be a major downfall when it comes to it. So looking at the measures that go into place, it's just got to cover so many different areas, but we do need to take into, fat amount, um, take into account the fact that it is very subjective and how that can be measured. So, Wow, 21%. That's fantastic. Absolutely. That's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. Um, yeah. And I was going to ask you, how do you do it? But you went on to explain how that is. You know? <laughs> But, but yeah. you did mention though that you know it's the bungee, right? And it's it's yeah. it is it is apparent, and sometimes it's not seen, it's not visible. It's just a mm -hmm. feeling that an employee has, right? They feel that they can't leave the desk. They have yeah. to be seen. They have to be in the office. Now flexibility, while the organization wants to give it, an employee doesn't feel it. In your mm -hmm. experience, how does a, a company address some of those concerns? Yeah, um, I think you touched on a good point. A lot of it can be employee perception. Um, more often than not, they put the pressure on themselves into thinking that there's a presenteeism in place. And in fact, there's no real justification for that. It could actually be from their peers or colleagues or rumor or gossip that actually gives people that perception. Um, we also know that, uh, particularly relative in the UK market, um, the financial markets and what's happening on the economy and the country is a massive push between how comfortable people feel working from home. So we tend to find that when the economy drops, there's a much higher presence in the workplace because people are cautious and anxious about being invisible. Um, so we notice that that puts the individual under their own pressure. Um, so a lot of that is around clarification and being absolutely clear in the communication to the individual about what your expectations are. If you're measuring by objectives and outputs, then it really shouldn't matter where you are doing that and when you're doing that, as long as you are performing. But then that all links back to the management style um, and it's very much top down. Are you fostering that kind of mentality in the workplace? And we can find that there's a big difference between certain individual managers that actually the way that they like to be managed and the way that they like to work can often be thrust onto the individuals and their team, which might not be the right approach for the individuals. And sometimes, again, some managers can look at managing their team on a generic management strategy rather than actually take into account that these are individuals who have different needs and communication styles and ways of working and ways of motivating them 
And we really need to work with managers to make sure that they understand the individuals in their team and that there's a mutual respect and trust that they can build together. But it's a two-way thing. It needs the individual and the manager just to sit in one-to-ones and actually just start communicating to clear the air on actually what is required. Underperformance is a different issue and that does need to be really carefully managed. But there's no reason why if you don't get your basis right in the beginning, that can't just develop in time. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great answer. And uh, it's, yeah, in, in my experience, I've totally, totally seen that too. And you can mm. look across teams and I'm sure as you look across different organizations or you interact with different, um, different clients, you see the mm. ones who will adapt and the ones who won't. You just know from the personality type. Absolutely. And you can just see and see all of that, yeah. you know. And I was then going to ask, how did you get into the psychology? But actually in this conversation, it's, it almost feels like it was a natural progression for you. Yeah. Given what you were doing, the outcomes, the conversations. Yeah, it's, um, it was an absolutely natural progression onto it because just understanding what makes people tick and what they need um, it is paramount. And I can't believe that workplace has gone on for so many years where that hasn't been the backbone of it. Um, it just seems that people have seen the Google office and just think, oh, I want, to, I want to do that or I want that element. I've seen this in another office. It's probably the worst thing that clients can say. Uh, I've got a photograph of something I really like somewhere else. Can we do that? And it's actually no, because is that right for your business and is that right for your people? And it absolutely needs this bespoke, tailored approach to it. But I just find that looking at people is just quite fascinating. Um, we're, we're just all so different. And why do we try and shoehorn everybody into the same mold so I, I fully support looking at workplace and workplace strategy and even change management in a different way and just you know these are things that people aren't going to come running up to you and thank you for but if you can just make their life better whilst they're in the workplace and more productive and healthier then why wouldn't you be doing that no i totally 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 agree with the, your approach and your, and your philosophy i think uh I think the trick, in, and I think I think there is a change in the mm. in the design process. I think uh, a lot of people are now understanding the insights that you're sort of presenting here, mm. and sort of trying to understand, okay, what are those components that we have to find out before we do engage and try and change? Because yeah. to your point, right, you move to a shiny new building, it looks shiny, but what's the functionality? You know, does it support the tasks and the functions, mm. the responsibilities, and employees are going to operate there. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of organizations have shifted to that. And your point on Google and Apple, I remember that so many years ago, you know, mm. that was the shiny light. But, you know, I think a lot of organizations were almost given a pass because of the investment that those organizations had to make into providing those type of uh, uh, facilities. And mm. a lot of organizations don't want to do that. But then we've moved now to an era where co-working locations are actually able to provide something similar maybe not yeah. as shiny, but the functionality and, the, and sort of the community spirit that the Google and Apple tried to create, they're now recreating at a, at a much cheaper scale. And I think that's mm. almost opened the eyes to uh, most organizations that actually that is achievable. I've certainly mm. seen that. I've seen that and talked with my peers on those things. So it's, it, yeah. certainly is, it certainly is something that's uh, quite prominent. Mm -hmm. So if you had to sort of describe workplace psychology design, what, what, mm -hmm. what would that be? Um, I would say it's about taking a step back, um, helps to be a third party in this because we tend to be able to extract surprisingly a lot more valid and accurate information. Um, it's taking a step back and just watching what happens, but it's also engaging with people and it's, it's filtering, it's collating data that you can filter. So in particular, attention to personality differences. Now we use the Carl Jung spectrum of introvert extrovert, ambivert, so that there's thousands of different measures on the market, but we use a very simplistic one that, you know, it's not full psychometric profiling, but it's just very broadly grouping people into certain characteristics and preferences. Um, but also the disk analysis is pretty good and that seems to be gaining in popularity. But just understanding what percentage of your work is kind of sit in those groups should very broadly give you a sense of balance in your workplace. So if you're much more highly introverted, scale then you would probably find that open plan isn't the right type of environment so therefore you would start to look at uh, noise distraction acoustics spaces to be on your own it's smaller group settings it would completely change how you consider your space just by understanding a layer of sort of the, the psychology of the personality 
The other areas to look at, um, slightly controversial, could be gender. Um, you know, it, it is a fact that men and women behave and engage differently in the workplace. And again, I think a lot of us are scared to broach on that whole area. But, you know, when we understand what men and women need from the workspace, even down to quite fascinatingly, the psychology of the type of furniture that they would choose to sit on. So we know that, you know, coffee shops are a perfect example of good design because their target market tends to be around the female. They want them to spend longer in their spend more money. Therefore, they put more armchairs, sofas, softer seats because women will naturally opt for that. Um, and when you look at that in workplace terms, if women are more drawn to these type of spaces and you've got a very high female workforce, then if it's about making them feel comfortable, relaxed, then you should consider these kind of elements in the workplace. But not to the detriment, because it's also known that they're three times likely to sit there. So therefore, you could argue, well, productivity could measurably decline if you suddenly splash them out everywhere in your office. It's just getting the balance right between understanding the difference of people in terms of their communication style. And the third area would be about multi-generational working. Understanding that we do have three to four, soon to be five generational groups side by side. And it is apparent that they are so different. And yes, it is stereotypical to some extent, but we do broadly fit into categories where you have boomers who, um, the older generation, who are just used to getting up and having a conversation and just finding people and talking to them. That is their preferred communication style versus the opposite end of that spectrum with your millennials who are known to message the person sat directly in front of them. Now, when we've got such poles apart characteristics, we can't look at workplace design as, um, as a generic because actually how do we get the boomers to teach the millennials around, this is how you collaborate, this is how you should feel comfortable getting up and finding out this information. But equally, we've also got millennials where technology is in their DNA. How do we get them to reverse mentor with the boomers and say, actually, if you do it this way, there's a shortcut or this will help you do that. And what we've tended to find is workplace design has just ignored and cut past all of that. And it hasn't actually drilled down into the potential um, and the power that comes from each of these individual generational groups. How do we tap into that and, and harness it and give the best back? So that we're looking at, you know, in the next 10 years, we're going to have boomers exiting the workplace. That's potentially going to leave an immense void for a business. They've got so much knowledge. And how are we going to fill that now? We've got an opportunity to do knowledge transfer, pass information through the organization, but that doesn't come by accident. It has to be purposefully thought through. So for us, when we look at psychology in workplace design and workplace strategy, it really is harnessing across personalities, genders, and demographics, and actually tailoring a design, not so that you've locked down into this era in time, but just understanding the differences and allowing the workplace to leverage off all of these differences, but also be flexible going forward because we know that these things are likely to change. And how do we, again, not go to the same mentality that we've been in previously of locking things down? How do we just keep it moving fluidly? And we think that psychology is a great way of embracing that, but also making sure you've got accountability. There's no point designing a space that looks amazing if people do not use it. It's a waste of resource. To just do the very basics of understand what people need and provide those types of spaces. And you often find it is the most cost effective solution. It doesn't have to cost you more money. No, I, I mean, the way my experience is if you ask employees and you go through systematic, you're not asking them what they want, but you do different, ask the question in multiple different ways. What employees want is really basic, right? They just mm -hmm. want the technology to do the job, uh, they yep. want good coffee. They want temperature. You talk about the, the, the gender differences. <laughs> Let's talk about temperature. You know, it's such a, a very oh, thing that it, yeah, you never yeah. win. You never win. No, but anyway, it's, it's, but, but in <laughs> essence, I, I totally agree with the, where you're coming from. So uh, the last element is change management. Mm. So, you know, you've mm. done interior design, the psychology. How do you get into that change management? Because I, I imagine that there must be some change management. One to the real estate department who's actually designing. How do they buy into this different way of thinking, those who may have not experienced it before, the senior leadership in sort of, you may have to propose a different way of mm -hmm. work and a different way of design. And then the employees, how do you then educate the employees on how to use the space? Because 
that has to be part of your process, right? Yeah, um, and it's an absolute um, imperative one that people have to consider. Um, so it's one thing to kind of develop the strategy, and we believe when it comes to consultancy, there's, there's more than one way of doing it. Um, so we would typically present three different models on a easy to achieve, this is what you could expect to get from it, level of change management is probably much more minimal and less intrusive, through to model C, which is pretty kind of, you could see in strategy terms, quite aggressive. And the jump in change is significant and that needs a lot, a lot more buy-in. Um, we believe in presenting the facts so that managers and the stakeholders can make their own informed decisions. So whilst we may propose model A, B and C, they need to be achievable. There's no point pushing something that is not achievable for the people that are part of that organisation. So we always look at change as part of this natural process. Um, but then what we start to do is work with the stakeholders to say, well, is there elements of each of these three that you like? Let's look at model D, E and F maybe until we actually agree on one defined strategy. And we, we believe that this needs to happen from the top. There needs to be a consistent buy-in to the approach that we're taking. We don't believe it could be compromised. It has to be, even if people aren't too sure in the stakeholder team at that point, we use the analogy of faking it till you make it. Um, the minute you walk out that room, you need to be on board and we'll work with you to make sure you get there. But we do appreciate that not everybody's kind of willing to do that initially. Um, they need to go through the change management process as much as anybody else does. But we all have to agree on what is the communication? Why are we doing this? That is the biggest question that people need to understand. Why? Because a lot of people will say, well, we've been doing this for 25 years and it's not broken. It's been profitable. Why do we need to change it? We need to really get to the communication uh, plan that says, this is what we've learned. These are the decisions we've made. And these are the reasons why we've made those decisions. And these are the objectives of this project. What do we want to get out of this? What are the measurable benefits we would like to experience? Now, when we produce a very detailed change management plan, we believe that is a key to success in change management. A plan that we all agree is, this is our communication approach. This is how we're going to do it. This is what we're going to say at the right time. And we all have to stick to this. In the absence of clear communication, this is where you get anxiety rise because rumors develop and we don't want that. So we need to be managing the communication from the offset. So we start with a clear direction from the leadership team and the stakeholders to say, in effect, entrust us as a team to say, go and make that happen. And it's our job then to put a plan in place that has a very sequential um, order of events and presentations and workshops where we communicate the right information at the right time. We don't want to overload people because um, it's too much to take in. And equally, we don't want to withhold information because then people will fill in their own gaps. So we believe that with the senior stakeholders kind of acting as the role models and the driving force behind this, behind the scenes, we then start at the bottom of the organization. So we would work with a group of project champions who just represent, do you know what? Normal people, normal people who are in there every day doing their job, they represent all of the different teams, all the different personality styles, we want men and women equal split. We want different age groups. We really need to get a sample representation of the champions. And what we do with the change champions is we, we kick them off on the change curve quicker. Now, everybody's going to go through the change curve. It's a natural part of our psychology. Um, some people will go through it quicker than others. Um, some people will adapt to change. Um, they love it and they will just go with it. Some people, that can be such an emotionally fraught journey that the loss, the identity, it's like a grieving cycle. Uh, we know it's going to happen. We can't, with change management, bypass it. But what we can do is lessen the damage of it. Um, so what we would do is we start the champions off early. Uh, let's get all of the stuff out there. You know, we want to put a ban on the word hot desking, which I just think is the worst word ever. Let's agree that. Let's agree. The facts, it does mean that you are going to lose your own desk. Let's be clear and honest about that. But, but what you get back instead is all of these different things. And what we need to do with the champions is train them to be the in-house gurus of everything to do with the working strategy. So they are the support mechanism that sits in the business day in, day out. And they give the, um, they're the conduit for support to their individual teams. So they're a vital group to work with. 
Um, they're also representative of them. So when we come to talk about housekeeping rules, I want to understand um, what, how long can you sit at a desk for? Are you allowed to eat at your desk? What can you eat at your desk? Let's understand all of these different issues. Um, and it's easier for a champion who's there every day to come up with that strategy rather than me, who's never going to work there, to stand up in front of people and say, well, I've created this rule because nobody's going to follow that. It's really got to be pragmatic and come from the people who are going to be doing this. Um, but they're also the people who will be coached in scenarios. So if this were to happen or someone were to say, how would you deal with that? So for us, we work with them consistently through the project, but we then work up a level. Managers. Managers have the biggest transition to make in, in kind of the, the more modern way of working. They might need to be managing a team that is less visible. How are they going to communicate? What happens with new starters? How are they going to manage under performance? What we need managers to do is start giving early consideration to what it means for them and their individual team members. And it might mean that they need to start working on an individual plan for each person, uh, which could take time. So it's vitally important that they understand hey, this is what's going to happen. This is what it might mean. Tell me what you're most concerned about. Let's collaborate as a group. Let's learn from each other how that might be dealt with. Um, but also to give them something to go away and think about. So managers need to be coached. And at this point, we then share with the wider organisation. So we've started with stakeholders, we've done the champions, we've worked with the managers. We then need to broadly communicate to the wider audience a bit at a time. This is what we learn. This is what it means. This is what we're going to do about it. This is what it means for you individually. Um, and there are some people in these sessions that don't want to stick their hand up. So we need to do drop in sessions that say, if you're really worried about this, you know, we don't want you to be panicking unnecessarily. Come and have a chat to us. Come and talk to us. And this particular time, we're going to be in this space. Um, and we would engage support then at every area of the organization. And then we go back to the beginning. So we the champions again, then the managers, then group presentations. We tend to find in a typical project that might have been a three cycle. So we might have done three to four champion workshops, three manager workshops, three group presentations. Um, just so that by the time it comes to the move-in date, we tend to manage change management backwards. It's from the move-in date back. Um, typically, we would tend to think so around sort of three to four months is, is a good time. We have achieved it in six weeks. Um, pretty tight but it's possible um what you don't want to do is start the communication too early and then people get bored and they kind of think i'm ready i'm ready but i'm still waiting and then suddenly it's like oh you know i can't be bothered we don't want that we want to ride on momentum excitement so that on day one people walk in and they understand now i don't expect them to be fully on board at that point some will um but some people will just be be the mentality i need to see it to understand it fully but it's our job to get them prepared for that so we would get them prepared for day one and then we need to think about their next six weeks so on average it's around 66 days to create a habit how do we make people do that um, and what are the personality and psychology hacks that we could coach people on actually these are really useful techniques that may work for you let's give this a go or let's coach them around how to be as productive as you can be uh, let's talk to them about wellness, well-being, mindfulness, managing stress. Let's use the opportunity in change management to address everything that is work-related, but also not work-related around them personally on how or what they bring to the workplace each day. So for us, change management is everything. It looks at culture, it looks at the physical work processes, but also the rules of engagement. You've created this space that's suddenly gone to being shared and you know, some people aren't too keen on that idea of sharing with someone else who maybe doesn't have the same hygiene levels as them. Um, what are we going to do about that? You know, let's think about it. Let's talk about it. Let's get it out there right from the very outset. So it's our job in change management to kind of find all of the issues, the risks and mitigate them. Um, but we do appreciate it's not 100% um, and we need massively the support of the stakeholders to trust us to go and do it, but also keep on track with the communication that we've outlined from the very beginning. No, that's, that's great. And sort of the question I want to follow up on that is, so is, is the process top down or bottom up in your opinion? Oh, I, I think it has to be both. Um, you can't look at it as one or the other. Um, you can have senior leadership who have a very clear direction. Um, hopefully the direction is, 
is the right thing and it's come out of a result of engaging and understanding what the organization the business actually needs um but there's also got to be this buy-in at lower level that the leadership aren't making these decisions to be detrimental to them or the business no one would make that decision there's got to be an element of trust that sits all the way around but equally we need a senior leadership team that trusts the people doing the job to just go and do it and it's about being adult about it, trusting people, letting them go, and just uh, designing a space that supports whatever they want to do and however they want to do it. It happens in that regard. But the day-to-day -day operational side of being in that workplace starts at the bottom. And those two just absolutely have to meet. So I don't think we can look at it as top-down or bottom-up. I really think it has to be a holistic approach to all of it to be successful. No, that's that's great. I totally, I totally, totally agree with you. Um, so obviously, you know, you you're based in the UK, but your your yeah. your consultancy is worldwide. So, what are the differences mm. you've seen um, across the the organ across the globe as you work with different organisations? How is this process different in different locations? Immensely, um, it, the people who make up the businesses are very different, but you also can't afford to ignore the the actual nation's culture um you know in the uk we've got a very specific type of work culture that exists um but you know when i look at work that i do in the us compared to asia is that culture massively comes into play in the workplace so yeah personalities are personalities and to be honest it doesn't matter where you are in the world that is translatable a lot of the generational if you're in kind of more of a developed world that is a pretty big consistent um approach um and even gender differences that is a pretty consistent so there's a lot of it that translates no matter where you are in the world which is why we can do this on a global scale but it's understanding differences so for example a really key priority for uk staff can often be I want a big cafe, I want a breakout space, I want gaming areas, I want to miss the commute after work and I just want to have a social event. So it's not uncommon to have like Prosecco and beer taps. Um, you know, these kind of things have become a lot more accepted in the UK workforce. But um, I noticed that when we work in, in the United States, and it depends on the East and the West Coast is different, um, holiday entitlement isn't the same in the United States as it is in the United Kingdom. So we tend to find that actually the focus and the key priority um, in the United States is around, I need to be as productive in the time I've got in this office because I don't want to stay late in the evening. I've got a family that I don't probably see as much of. Um, I don't get the same level of holiday. So actually the social side of the workplace isn't as important. It's around how do I squeeze as much out of those eight hours to make my work-life balance better? So we notice the focus is around shorter meetings meeting mantras stand-up spaces it's privacy acoustics it's less distractions it's much more focused around getting through their job as effectively and productively as they possibly can be um, whereas then we look the other end of the spectrum into the asian side um, and wellness and well-being um, is a fundamental part of what they do you know that that whole individual empowerment of that and looking after your mental physical and emotional state is one of their key priorities so for them it's not so much about the physical workplace it's not about the social side it's around how do i take the best care of the people who work for me so you've just got in this one world such a different way of approaching it and what we don't want to do is pick up a model or an approach that that worked for maybe um you know the the london arm of a particular company and then let's look at their la division and say well let's just roll out the same thing because it worked in london but I, we can almost guarantee it's not going to work there um so it's how do we create this unified strategy that no matter where in the world you are if you drop into one of your offices you kind of understand it you understand the, the rules of that space and how it's made up but you allow for the local cultural variation that exists um, in your locality, but also with the individuals that make up your particular workforce. So we can look at an overarching strategy, but it has to be very much tailored to the individual country and company. Hannah, that's phenomenal. We, we cover so much and uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Good. I appreciate your, your insights, I appreciate your knowledge, and I appreciate you sharing. Um, I just want to finish with two questions. Um, right. So first one, 
What, what would be the number one thing anybody can do to maximize workplace productivity? Um, do not do a one size fits all and don't hit repeat on the way that you've always done it. Um, fairly confident that it's not going to be working. So look at um, assigning your workplace with multiple work settings that no matter what you need to be doing at any given point, there is a space that is perfectly designed for that particular task. And just encourage people to just keep moving around, but also build a culture of trust and innovation. Allow people to go and use the spaces in the way that you've intended them and allow them to bring the best out of themselves. Well, there's, there's a lot in there for one thing. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. And then <laughs> a second, the final question is, what is the one thing somebody could do to maximize the employee experience? Um, firstly, to engage with them, understand what it is that you actually need to be providing as an employer to bring the best out of the employee. So engage with them, but don't just sit on it. Make sure that you communicate back with them and act on what they need. If you've got a big consensus of, hey, this isn't working right now, but this would be much better. Don't, don't ignore that. That's powerful information. Um, so act on it, but also involve people in the process of change. If they're involved in it, they will come with you and you will get the best out of every person that works for you. Great, great. Thank you so much, Hannah. And no uh, for, for those who are watching, just uh, click on the link below. We have a link to, to Hannah's profile at Open Source Workplace. There you can read more about Hannah and also reach directly out to her. So, uh, so once again, thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Cheers. Thank you.